Hey, so uh, I'll, I guess I'll get started. Uh, and we'll wait for the people to pour in as they're coming in. Um, I'm going to talk about scaling at uh, Aeroception. Uh, I'll start by saying a little bit about me first. Uh, I am the founder and the only developer at Aeroception. It's a huge team of one person. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, wow. Uh, and I've been, I've been a JavaScript developer for half the life of JavaScript, as, as Vishal already pointed out. It's been 17 years or so. And like half the life of JavaScript, I've been a developer. Uh, it's, it's a little shameful because like when I started, you know, we used to use like uh, layers and uh, you know stuff like that. It was like good, good old days. Anyway, um, so uh, what is Aeroception? I, I don't want to make this a product pitch, um, but I'll just like quickly run through uh, what it is. It's, it's this little snippet of JavaScript that you insert into your page and it catches errors uh, that happen uh, in the browser. Uh, uh, while, it, while, while your app is running at your user's end, right? So like, uh, it's sort of like Google Analytics, but like you drop it in and it catches errors and stuff for you. Uh, there are over a thousand active projects, like a million errors caught per month on average. It's closer to two million right now. Um, uh, and you know, so this is, uh, this is what Aeroception is, and that's my pitch. I'm not going to talk any more about how awesome Aeroception is. Um, I'll, you know, I'll, I've sort of structured this talk as a, as a sort of story uh, where this is going to be sort of the uh, the experiences of a client-side, primarily client-side developer uh, who sort of started with uh, doing uh, server-side JavaScript with Node and uh, how that worked out. So, you know, along the process, I can talk to you about how I scaled it to this, to this level. Um, my first startup had failed. I'd spent about five or six months on it and it had failed. Uh, well, I guess it's good that it failed early, better than failing after two years, right? Uh, and so I decided to launch the second one, which happened to be Aeroception, except I was not in a great state of mind having lost all that money and stuff like that. So uh, I set myself a timeline of 15 days. And I decided to launch Aeroception, like literally from the time I bought the domain to the time when it went live in 15 days. Um, and uh, I had no real backend experience before this. You know, I had never done anything uh, serious on the server side before. Uh, so obviously the code was totally crap. Uh, there were absolutely no tests. And there was no thought put towards scaling. Uh, and I thought that's fine, right? Because uh, I launch and like nobody's going to find out. Who cares about you know another another website that's up somewhere, right? And so like it doesn't matter. Uh, it was one single monolithic uh, Node.js app, and it basically talked to MongoDB, and that was it. That was the architecture, right? It was a very simple uh, setup, uh, and it sort of worked. You know, can't complain. It sort of worked. Uh, it did its job. Uh, and it was running off a single, like, I, I'm, I'm a cheap guy, um, so it used to run off a really cheap VPS uh, hosted somewhere in the US uh, with only 512 MB RAM. Uh, and this worked. I mean, I had the option of upgrading, but I was not sure if I'm going to succeed this time with my startup. I mean, it could have failed again, right? So why invest heavily on hardware when, uh, when you don't even know if you're going to succeed yet? So uh, I, when I launched, I sort of submitted to Hacker News, and I was number one on Hacker News for a couple of hours. Uh, and, you know, there's nothing that can ro go wrong with that, right? <laughs> well, actually, uh, Node uh, withstood the load from Hacker News pretty easily. And that's because most of the people from Hacker News just come to your homepage and then talk crap about how, how crappy your product is, right? Uh, that's, that's the Hacker News crowd. So, uh, so that did not actually test my application, really, because it was just serving static pages. So, you know, it all looked fine. Um, Let's see. I hope this works. <coughs> so everything looked good, except you know when it was on Hacker News, people started noticing it. And then about a couple of days later, there was this big Russian website. Now, obviously, I'm not Russian. I, I don't know too much about Russian websites. Uh, but this website was huge in Russia. I did not know about that. Uh, and they uh, they decided I, I'm not going to name them because you know obvious reasons. But you know and. He decided to start using, uh, happened to become a good friend later, and you know, he came down to India, we caught up and stuff like that. Uh, but he uh, decided to launch uh, with Aeroception on his site. And uh, I did not realize how massive it was going to be. It was, you know, a couple of hundred requests uh, uh, per second, and uh, they were posting errors at the rate of something like 10 errors per second from the site. Uh, now, these numbers are not bad. This should look all right, right? Uh, well, it was all right for 
Nginx and for, uh, for Linux, you know, which was like sort of uh, shouldering it for me, right? Uh, but Node did not handle it very well, even at such a low, uh, at such a low load. Um, but it wasn't Node's fault, it was actually my fault. Uh, my code was crappy. Uh, so, you know, that brings me to the first lesson, if you're ever programming with Node and you want to build a system to scale, is that do not do anything that takes up CPU in your code. It is the biggest mistake that you can ever do. Uh, and, you know, I can go over the reasons, but I'm pretty sure you are already familiar with what the reasons are, is that you're sort of clogging up the event loop and, like, nothing else can happen at that time. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if you've got uh, tight code paths, code paths that are executed frequently, uh, you, you, you generally don't even want to have even small loops or something over there, because that will, like, totally mess up how you work with the event loop. Uh, I used to have uh, hot code paths uh, for deduplication of errors. So when an error comes into error reception, it's then, you know, compared against several other errors that are already recorded. And if there is any duplicate, they're sort of marked as duplicates of each other. And, you know, as is obvious, this will require some sort of iteration. It will require to go over errors that are already recorded and then figure out if there is duplicates in them and then sort of mark them as duplicates. So that, is, that was happening for every error that was getting posted. And if, if you're doing this 10 times a second and you're doing this in your Node app, then, you know, you're, you're screwed. Um, so obviously, you know, my first step was to rewrite all the hot code paths. I had to reduce or eliminate, if possible, all the loops that were there. Uh, and, you know, somebody, uh, one of my mentors taught me about this. He's like, he told me that I'm too old school in, in the way I use the database, in the sense that uh, I try to avoid talking to the database because it's going over the network and, you know, that's considered to be expensive and so on and so forth. Uh, he said, no, forget about that, you know, be chatty with the database if you have to. Rather than keeping data with you inside memory and then trying to loop over that data in memory, which you think will be faster, it's just better to go over to the database and ask for that data again and come back. And there is no harm in doing that. That's absolutely fine. Uh, so that was, that was like a revelation to me and it turns out that was actually very good advice. Uh, I also had to rethink, obviously, the logic for finding duplicates. How do I identify duplicates and so on? So that it's not an iterative process, but it's some sort of lookup rather than iteration. Uh, so that helped me uh, scale a node on the same machine without having to, you know, give it too much infrastructure. Uh, and, you know, that looked fine. A couple of months later, uh, a big advertising company, happens to be an Indian advertising company, uh, happens to also be my previous employer, so that was a good thing. Uh, they decided to use uh, Airception. Uh, you know, I was excited. They signed up for the most expensive plan. Um, uh, that makes me, you know, some amount of money. So I decided to go blow it at the bar uh, because that's what you do when you get some money, right? So, uh, and, uh, you know, everything was looking good. I was making plans, calling up my friends. I was like, dude, did you hear about this? Like, we need to celebrate, right? And like, I, I, was, I was ready to do that when suddenly I start, get, start getting alerts saying that something's wrong with the server, right? And I was like, oh, dude, this is, this is crude now. Uh, what happened is that they were the, they were an advertising company that was supplying ads to Yahoo and the ads went on Yahoo's homepage, right? So all of Yahoo's homepage traffic started coming to my, you know, <laughs> my server <laughs> on, on the VPS, right? Um, and, and by the time I had done a little upgrade, so my server was at, at 768 MB, one machine, 768 MB RAM. Uh, and all of Yahoo's homepage traffic hitting my server, not, not a good thing to happen. Um, so, uh, you know, I had read this from, from what one of the Instagram folks, uh, where he said that scaling is like replacing all the components of a car while you're driving it at 100 miles per hour, right? And it's true, like you can't, uh, you can't take a downtime, you know, you have to scale instantly and nobody should notice what's going on. So. Uh, the first thing I want to impress upon you is that scaling is very unsexy. You know, it's not, uh, it's not glamorous. It's not like we can talk about, oh, you know, we've got to build this beautiful stack, this, that, and the smallest problems in scaling are actually very, very uh, stupid problems. The first one is, is raising the number of sockets that you can handle on your OS, right? That's a big win. Secondly is making sure that you're using the right number of worker processes at Nginx and stuff like that. You know, that helps a lot, like tuning how the load is going to get balanced across all your processes. Uh, 
and this was the most unsexy of all of them. What I did is I just called them up, right? <laughs> I told them, dude, you're screwing with my server. Can you please like get me off Yahoo? Right? I don't want to be on Yahoo right now. Give me 15 minutes. I'll sort it out, right? But like, I, like get me off Yahoo's page right now. And they, you know, fortunately, I know them, and they they you know responded to that. Uh, the moment they removed it from Yahoo, of course, the server recovered in about 15 minutes. Uh, and then the first thing I did was like I, I you know, went on to Amazon, figured out how to use their CDN, and, and you know got a CDN, uh, you know got got some CDN, uh, got stuff set up on the CDN essentially. And uh, and you know when I did that, uh, I, I sort of wrote a, wrote a blog post marketing it as, as being all geo optimized and like now it's cached locally and shit like that. Fact of the matter was that you know my server could not handle it, so that's why I had to do it. But you know marketing always wins, right? Um, and you know, all, I had had enough by this time, right? I was, by this time, I was going like when I when I used to hang out with with friends at bars, I had to take my laptop with me, just in case anything went wrong, right? And I had to sit down and tether my iPhone to it, and you know, connect to the internet and just monitor my servers, making sure everything is fine while my friends are like getting drunk, right? So it's not the best sort of setup to to be in. And so I decided that it's time to now, you know, be a sort of architecture astronaut or whatever, and figure out how to how to like actually make the scale. And that's what the crux of this talk is about. I want to just sort of impress upon you one idea of scaling. And this has worked very, very well for me. And I, I just, the reason I'm telling this to you is probably because uh, I, can't, I can't imagine why other people are not doing this enough. It's just so simple. Everybody just should, should be doing it. So, you know, a quick rundown of all the problems that I wanted to solve. First one was that I had absolutely no confidence in my code. Uh, you know, the code quality totally sucked. Uh, and I, I was making changes and basically praying, uh, hoping that it would work, right? So that's not good. Uh, I did not have any monitoring, very little monitoring. I had built it in 15 days, right? So you can't build all of this stuff at that time. Uh, and, you know, I'm a huge fan of keeping things simple. So, you know, I wanted to remove complexity from the app rather than adding complexity as much as possible. So just because I want to, like, scale up the architecture does not mean I'm going to make it far more complex. In fact, by scaling up the architecture, if I could make it simpler, that would be preferable, right? And of course, the last problem was about deployment, uh, which I'll talk about in some amount of detail. First of all, when you deploy a new node app, it requires a restart. Your server has to take a little bit of a downtime to, to do a restart. And downtimes are bad, we know that. Sometimes the downtime is longer. If you want to do a database migration from one, say, schema to another schema, uh, this, could, this could be a time-consuming operation. And so you don't, you know, you, your app is down at that time because you don't want to hammer stuff at your database or read stuff from your database while your app is down. So deployment is, you know, it's, it's tricky. Uh, and, you know, obviously when errors, when, when the site is down, I'm not collecting any errors and sort of, you know, that's my business value proposition. If I'm not collecting errors, you know, my site is useless. Uh, and, you know, obviously an app that's down looks bad. But on the other hand, you don't want to minimize the number of deployments you do. You want to actively deploy as frequently as possible, right? So now, how do you, how do you deal with this? Uh, by the way, I recommend that you guys, this guy is the creator of Clojure, uh, Rich Hickey. Uh, and uh, honestly, I haven't looked at Clojure in too much detail. I'm, I'm not on the Lisp side of things. But this guy is a great philosopher of how to do computing. So, you know, just watch this talk called Simple Made Easy where he impresses upon you the idea of having simplicity in your architecture. And it's just so beautifully, he puts across his points so elegantly, it's amazing to listen to him. Uh, and this was, he was a huge influence for my uh, design going forward. So uh, this, was, this was the most important thing, is that rather than having one monolithic app, I decided to break up the app into several small components that would talk to each other separately. right? Uh, each piece is doing just one thing and doing it well. This is very close to the Unix philosophy, where you got one thing and that does only one thing and does it well, right? So it started moving closer to that rather than having a large monolithic application. Uh, each of these independent pieces are deployed independently and are versioned independently. So they scale independently, right? If there is a problem, the problem is not with the entire app. The problem is with one small app that does one small thing. It's a much easier problem to solve now rather than trying to figure out how to scale the entire app at one time, right? So that's amazing. Uh, and so, you know, obviously you have to figure out how they will talk to each other. So there's some sort of message passing system between them. Uh, I happen to chance upon Redis, which is just a brilliant, brilliant way to sort of buffer up 
to set a buffer between you and the database. So Redis, and you know, Redis is sort of de facto for almost every node stack, simply because it's so elegant to work with. I strongly recommend that you have a look at, at Redis if you're doing anything on the server. Uh, and you know, it's great for storing temporary data, uh, and it's got amazing primitives for, for dealing with atomic operations. It's awesome. Uh, and then there are queues. Queues is just a fantastic idea. The idea that you're going to take a task and then keep that somewhere in a queue for someone else to pick up and do later. So you know, when you've got apps split up into multiple pieces, you can take an app that you know, generates some output and that's, that's handed over to another app by dumping that into a queue. And now there's someone else who's going to pop out from the queue and do something with that, right? So that's just a brilliant idea. And I'll explain why this is brilliant. Is, oh yeah, is the last point right here. Is that uh, if you, so you know, if you kill one of the applications that's in the stack, uh, what will happen is the queue will start building up, right? Because now the app is not popping out from the queue. However, the site does not look down. The site still looks like it's up because errors are still going into the queue, right? Uh, and so now you can take apps, parts of your app out, and, uh, and then you could, you know, restart them or like, you know, whatever, service them the way you want, and then get them back online to start flushing out from the queue. And this is just so elegant, it's amazing. You can like bring down parts of your site without having to bring down the entire site. So Errorception isn't just one site, obviously. It just isn't just one app. It has got uh, the UI server, which deals with, you know, which is written in Express, for those who are familiar with Node, uh, which, which is basically dealing with everything to do with HTTP. Uh, I've got a simple, super lightweight, pure Node.js server that is actually collecting the errors. It's just 90 lines of code. It's very, very simple. All it does is it takes the error and it dumps that into Redis. That's it. As, as the error comes in, it takes it and dumps that into Redis. It uses cluster to sort of create multiple instances of itself so that, you know, that is not a bottleneck. Um, yeah, it uses cluster and uh, it dumps them into a Redis queue. Uh, and then there are multiple stages through which the error will pass, going from app to app, queue to queue, uh, and then finally getting written to the database. So you can think of these as being map operations, and then finally it gets reduced to Mongo, it gets written to Mongo, so that's sort of like a reduce operation, so it's like map and reduce happening, but it's using uh, Redis and Mongo as the storage uh, and, and communication sort of layers. Uh, Obviously, when, when you start having multiple apps and then you have multiple instances of the same app and so on, you start running into problems with consistency, where let us say that one app has figured out that this data does not exist. Say in the case of deduplication, right? So uh, there is an error and this error does not exist in the database so far, so I discover this is a new error now. And so I'm going to write this error. Meanwhile, somebody else must have queried and he must have figured out that's a new error as well. And so now there are two people who think it's a new error and they are trying to write this, right? So this gets you into an inconsistent state in the database. So you want to, you want to figure out how to solve that. Uh, and so there is this project that I created, which is up on GitHub. You can, you know, feel free to use it. Uh, it will only help all of us. Uh, it's, it gives you a locking primitive using Redis. So you can uh, obtain a lock on something. Uh, and so, for example, if you're going to write something to a database and you want to ensure that nobody else is going to write to the database at the same time, you can see that I want a lock on that entry. Uh, and then you can, uh, you know, get someone else, you can get the other uh, process to wait till that lock is released before you can write to it. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, there's one small problem that remains. I haven't solved this problem yet. And, you know, uh, it's, it's sort of an ugly solution, but let's figure, let's talk about this. There is shared logic, right? So for example, when writing an error, I want to check rate limiting, this, that, and the other as well. But on the front end, I also want to make sure that, uh, uh, so, you know, there is the error logging piece that is doing, the, that has to check rate limiting and so on. But on the front end, on the UI also, I want to, like, present to the user if there is a rate limiting uh, error that has happened. Uh, and, you know, the logic for the rate limiting has to be common. I have to figure out a way to share that logic across these applications. How do I do that? Turns out, like, there were a lot of complicated approaches I took uh, using some sort of so, uh, service-oriented style so that there's one component that's talking to multiple things and so on. Um, tried several solutions. All of them failed in very interesting ways, uh, and we can talk about that at length. Uh, but, you know, in the end, it just caused a lot of errors, a lot of downtimes. Uh, there were restarts that were happening very frequently. Uh, to the point that I had to write a script that would do restarts for me. You know, it had gotten to that point. It was just, it was very ugly. There was literally a cron that was running once every hour that was restarting my processes. It was just bad. Uh, 
So, uh, you know, how do you now share code across, across uh, processes? How does Node do it? was my first question. Turns out the answer is actually very simple. They just use Node modules, right? Which is all your Node modules sitting, and that's the way to share code, right? So it's just very elegant. Um, so what I did was I created a models folder, which was all my app logic. And then I just symlinked that into the node modules folder of all of my other applications, right? So it's very easy. And uh, so now the code is literally shared across multiple applications uh, beautifully. It works, but it has drawbacks, and we can talk about that later. Um, so, you know, in the end, uh, uh, this is my stack at a reception. It uses Express for the website. Uh, it's a pure node server for catching errors. Uh, Redis is used everywhere. Uh, MongoDB is like there's Mongoose layered on top of MongoDB to talk to Mongo. Uh, I use Forever as a process manager. There are 24 node processes on production as opposed to just one when I had launched. Now there are 24 processes that are sort of harmoniously working towards catching errors. And, uh, uh, you know, it's still working off one machine. You know, it's now far more beefed up than it was before. And there is still a failover machine as well. But there's still one primary machine and everything is running off of that. Uh, very quickly towards the end, I've got some ideas about how this can be improved, and I'll probably start talking about this very quickly in the community. So, uh, you know, you could follow me on, on GitHub or somewhere, uh, and, you know, uh, I'll be start starting to explore these ideas. In fact, I, I'm hoping to work with some people who might have experience in this. So if you, if you have any ideas, you know, please, please join in, and we could, like, have a discussion there. Uh, and that's all I have. Thanks. Was I good on time? <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, any questions? Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for giving a great talk. Um, Thanks. We learned quite a lot from your experience. Um, the couple of questions I had. Yeah. Uh, one, how is your uh, Redis log different from using some primitive like setX, uh, check, and uh, there is a locking mechanism using right. Setex. So uh, the Redis lock uses the locking mechanism that is described using setX on the Redis website. Okay. So it's a rather elaborate sort of process of like how to store keys and how to remove them and delete them and so on. It is an implementation of exactly that algorithm, though. Okay. Uh, can I ask? Go ahead. Go ahead. So uh, one thing I would be curious to know is, uh, did you face any problem scaling Mongo? Your seems to be a write-heavy app, and I've read a lot of stuff saying Mongo. Doesn't handle right heavy. Yeah. No, stuff. MongoDB is web scale. <laughs> no, I haven't faced any trouble with Mongo at all. Uh, Mongo has been uh, smooth sailing. It, it's a little hard to figure out how to do indexes and stuff like that, right? Uh, in all honesty. Uh, but maybe because I'm just an amateur with it in terms of figuring out how the queries will run and stuff like that. But once I got that right, Mongo was just, it has not been a trouble at all. It has been, it has been very smooth. Adi, you were saying something? I have a question. Um, um, I love Airception. I love the concept of having a central place for all your errors and all. Thanks. But uh, the web app, the web applications are the only. They aren't, they aren't the only things we're using nowadays. Uh, we have things like Cordova. Cordova. What is that? Cordova. Cordova. Yeah. Right. Yeah. PhoneGap. Um, or we have Titanium. Or we have offline web apps uh, using Web SQL Index CB, blah, blah blah. What all not? And these apps can go offline and online, and reception might not be available. In fact, n nothing on the internet might be available, right. and there might be errors happening right. at this time. Right. So do you have anything in place, or you plan to make something in place to catch these errors, like buffer them up, and send them when you go online? No, no, I don't. And you're the you're the web storage guy. That's why you're asking me this question. Yeah, but the, 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 this is an important question because no, a lot of applications are gonna be offline eventually. Uh, right. The Chrome OS is picking up. Right. Um, the many many web apps that are um, using web storage more frequently now, it would be nice to have uh, a buffering mechanism. Right. If you're online, I'm guessing uh, you kind of at least push it to an array somewhere, or you dire do you directly push it? No, it sits in an array, it gets buffered for some time, and okay. then it's sent up to the okay. server. So it's but you're right. Yeah, yeah, it is batched up because otherwise but it doesn't, it doesn't make persist sense. across sessions. If you close the window and you come back, right, it does not persist across sessions. So it gets, uh, yeah, you're right, and and you're right. It probably makes sense to start adding and thinking about storage. You're, you're definitely right. Hey, uh, did you uh, start using a reception yourself? 
Of course. Yeah. Interception's yes. website uses interception. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so, at what? I mean, how long did it take for you to actually start using it yourself? Uh, well, to be absolutely honest, it uh, took me. Well, I did not use interception because since I had built it in 15 days, there was actually no client side JavaScript when I had launched it. So it did not make sense for me to use interception for the longest time. But then after some time, the moment I got JavaScript in on the UI to make it all Ajaxy because you know we are all web 2.0 are we still web 2.0 no we are not web 2.0 anymore 4.0 but you know when i started adding javascript a reception was and you know uh, again this is a pitch though but you know within within minutes i found my first error and i was able to fix it and deploy code within 5 minutes and that's just awesome uh, the feeling of having to figure out errors that was otherwise not possible to find is just awesome hey, uh, this is varun from uh, hyderabad uh, actually, you, you in the last slide you had mentioned that uh, you're using Forever for uh, the right. process watching, right? Right. So I recently tried out uh, something called Not dot JS. Mm -hmm. So have you? Uh, I mean, you ever did a comparison with uh, Forever? Or could you? Could you? What was that again? Uh, not Not dot JS. N O T. So N A U G H T. N A U G H T. So it, it, it does almost the same thing, wherein uh, so it has an option for uh, deployment also. Right. So it doesn't right. kill your existing process, so that mm. you can there will be zero downtime, and you can still serve your uh, existing uh, request. Right. And uh, so whenever the new process come up, it will actually switch back to the new process. Oh, that's interesting. I need to because that's yeah. very similar to what I was talking about yeah. in terms of. Yeah, I'll I'll have a look at that. I haven't heard of that before. I'll okay. have a look at that. That looks very okay. interesting. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, you spoke briefly about uh, talking to the DB uh, versus uh, keeping the data in the memory. Right. And you said talking to the DB was not too bad of an idea. Right. Uh, can you explain what uh, DB operations were you doing and uh, where talking to the DB was, not, uh, was better than keeping in the so, memory? So what I was doing was I was keeping a certain collection of errors that happen most frequently at the website in memory. Uh, in the hope that I can speed that up and not, not talk to the database. So if I have it in memory now, I can just try to iterate over it and get that data out and then sort of use that, you know, for the most frequently occurring errors. So I don't have to go over to the DB frequently. That was the idea. Turns out that was a very bad idea. And so that is where I got stuck. Uh, so basically you get the most frequent errors at the init and keep them in the memory or you do it on the fly? On the fly. On the fly. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. No problem. So, yeah, there's one question here. Yeah, as I understand the two parts to your application, one is collecting errors, the other is to uh, UI to view those errors right. or something. Right. Um, so what I wanted to ask is, uh, is Node a good option for the other part, like where I, a web application where I view data? Uh, uh, well, for someone like me, it's great because I know only JavaScript, so you know, it's awesome. But I guess uh, if it's just simple CRUD apps, then maybe Node is not necessarily uh, particularly great at that. Uh, you know, and I think everyone in the Node community would agree with that as well. Is that it? I have a minute more, so you can fire questions if you want. <laughs> Hi. So you talked about scaling the uh, node, but you haven't talked anything on the data storage side or the database side. Uh, what's what's about scaling them? And uh, so I have not had any trouble with that. Uh, I, for the sake of redundancy, I'm uh, having a Mongo cluster, which is essentially just one more server where it's getting replicated to. But that's only to make sure that I don't lose data. Uh, I am not actually. I have not had scaling trouble with my data store at all. Could you uh, like uh, tell how much uh, I/O is the per second kind of thing? Like how much? In oh, I don't know the the latest uh, numbers, sadly. But I'm it's very very frequent. I'm talking to the database like like I'm mad. Like <laughs> there's there's a lot of I/O happening with the database. I I'm not sure. It must be it must be to the tune of a couple of hundred queries uh, every every maybe two or three seconds. So it's okay. like not I mean it's not crazy, but it's not uh, uh, it's not low either. You know, it's pretty high. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Cool. Thanks a lot, guys.